Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you all to this evening's lecture by uh, Dr. Abu Amin Abilal Phillips. Uh, we are fortunate to have him here and he will be speaking on the topic Think Win Win Motto of a Believer. Uh, I request Dr. Bilal Phillips to deliver a speech, inshallah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasuli al kareem wa ala ali wa sahabi wa man istanna bi sunnati raum al deen. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. Our topic this evening, think win-win, motto of the believer. The principle of think win-win is taken from the seven habits of highly effective people, written by Stephen J. Covey. Habit number four. However, his perspective was in looking at interpersonal uh, relationships, how we deal with people. Whereas, what I am looking at is the Islamic philosophy on human interaction with the world around us. It includes people as well as the events in our lives, the circumstances in which we are born, etc. It is all inclusive, not restricted only to interpersonal relationships. But before going to look at that principle, win-win for the believer, let us look at the philosophy of the disbeliever, which will help us to understand more clearly the win-win philosophy of the believer. As we know in our declaration of faith, we say, La ilaha illallah. We deny the falsehood first of the false worshipping of false gods, and then we establish the worship of the true God. So let us look at the philosophy of the disbelievers with regards to life in general. We find that their philosophy is win-lose. The philosophy of the disbelievers with regards to their relationship to the world around them is one of win-lose. What do I mean? Good luck, bad luck. Win-lose is equivalent to good luck, bad luck. Meaning, they say, if I have good luck, then I win. If I have bad luck, then I lose. That's their philosophy and life. This is something which even the atheist, the person who says there is no God, disbeliever in truth, that's what governs his or her life. Good luck, bad luck. So what you find is that the disbelievers spend most of their lives in a quest for what will ensure for them good luck and prevent bad luck from happening to them. That becomes a very important part of their lives. And what you find in the West, where I come from, seven is a good luck number. So they'll try to do things around seven. Four, if you have what is called a four-leaf clover, it's a plant. Normally it has three leaves on the stalk. But if you find one with four, good luck. It's a sign of good luck. So people will get those and they will put them inside of little plastic uh, capsules and they wear them on their wrist or around the neck, whatever. It's for good luck. At the same time, you try to avoid certain bad luck thing numbers, like 13. In the West, 13 is a bad luck number. So, in the average uh, apartment building, hotel, etc. in the West, the floors, when you go in the elevators, there you'll see the numbers 10, 11, 12, 14, 15. What happened to 13? No 13. You walk down the street, 
you'll see the houses are numbered 10, 11, 12, 12 and a half, 14, what happened to 13? This is a norm in the society. I know in, where you are here, that number is 8. Huh? 8 is the bad luck number. If your uh, license plate adds up to 17, for example, which means 1 plus 7, that equals 8. Not a good number. It lowers the value of your car. Right? Bad luck. Also, you have widows. If a widow comes in your presence, it's bad luck. You don't want to have widows around you. Uh, dead bodies. The dead body crosses you when you're leaving your home. Oh, bad day. Firewood. Also, the dobi. And you, you have a calendar here for bad hours of the day. Your uh, ragu kalam. Right? And your yamagandam. Right? These are all bad luck. Two hours every, four hours every day are bad luck hours. Don't try to do anything good in these hours, right? And so you have a series of these kinds of charms that people seek out to uh, protect themselves from evil and to bring for themselves good luck. We can laugh about that in regards to other people's beliefs, but unfortunately, Cultural Muslims have their own substitutes. Hmm, don't we? So our numbers, we have 19. 19 becomes a good luck number. Because the basmala, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, is made up of 19 letters. So we have some Muslims who, for them, 19 is an auspicious number. And they favor it. And the 99 names of Allah. People believe that if you recite a certain name of Allah, you know, you, you can't, your wife can't have a baby, okay? Recite this name of Allah so many times, you know, blow it over water and drink it uh, after Maghrib, having fasted that day, and your wife's gonna have a baby. Similarly, some people believe that, you know, your business is not good, okay, so you take another name of Allah, Ar Razak, for example, then you make a, a, a piece of bread, right? When you're making your bread, so you squeeze the uh, flour in the shape of ar-razzaq then you cook it right you have a loaf of bread with ar-razzaq and you eat that inshallah you're going to be successful what is this this is charms amulets turning the names of allah into good luck charms which has no basis from the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam also we have miniature qurans qurans that are made one inch by one inch by one inch thick people discover them and boast about how they have the smallest Quran in the world what is this Quran good for you put it in a locket you wear it around your neck believing that it's going to protect you from evil so we turn the Quran into a good luck charm because that Quran is not for reading you open it up the letters are so small you would need a magnifying glass a microscope actually to read what is written on there so, this is the way, in general, of the disbelievers, in general, as well as poor or weak believers, cultural Muslims, Muslims who live by custom and tradition and not according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Qur'an and the Sunnah, as it was understood by the Sahaba. Now the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood by you and I, by modern Muslims, the modern interpretations. No, the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood by the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They best understood it. So, if we leave now the disbeliever understanding of win-lose and we come over to the Islamic understanding, the Islamic philosophy of win-win, it is based on the Islamic world view that this world is fundamentally a test. This world is fundamentally a test for human beings. As Allah said in Surah Al-Mulk, verse 2, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا the one who created death and life, 
in order to test which of you is best in deeds. And in Surah Al-Kahf, verse 7, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةِ لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَكُهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Indeed, I have placed, what I have placed on the earth is an adornment for it, in order to test which of them is best in deeds. So Allah has identified clearly the purpose of this world. This world is a test. Not a test for Allah to find out which of us is best in deeds. Because it's something he already knew. Before Allah created this world, he already knew which of us is best in deeds. He already knew which of us is going to hell and which of us is going to heaven. This was already known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes beckons us to give our zakat, an important fard and a pillar of Islam. Several fatwas of distinguished scholars of Islam worldwide state that zakat can be given to support a non-profit Islamic satellite channel whose aim is to spread the truth of Islam. Every dollar you contribute helps Peace TV to refute allegations against Islam, misconceptions about Quran. What better choice do you have to spread the truth of Islam than Peace TV? Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donation to Islamic Research Foundation International, Islamic Bank of Britain, Coventry Road, Birmingham, UK. Account number 0113201. Sort code 300083. Not a single African tribe ever worshipped images before the white man came. Not one. They all worship God. Different, different name, but the concept, same. Islamic, Islamic, Islamic. He's a Muslim. He doesn't know. He's got the wrong label on. The Christian has Christianized him and make them to worship Jesus Christ. We have done nothing, really. Islam in Africa in Man with a Mission, coming soon on Peace TV. Najat unhi loko hafil hogi jo log iman laate hain. वो इंसान जो अल्लाह ताला के साथ किसी को शरीक कहराता है उसको हकीकत का इम नहीं है कामयाब हुआ वो इंसान जिसने अपने नफ्स का तस्किया किया वो खाना जिसके ऊपर गैरुल्लाह का नाम लिया हो वो खाना हराम है जकात ये इंसान के माल को पाक और साफ करता है नमाज बेहयाइयों और मुनकर से रोकती है गुलशन ए ईमान हर पीर बुध और जुमा शाम 6 बजे यूके में और शाम सात बजे यूरोप में बीस टीवी पर सो दिस टेस्ट दो दर्स सेज इन ऑर्डर दैट ही वुड ट्राई यू और टू टेस्ट देम विच ऑफ देम इज बेस्ट इन डीड्स इट इज रियली टू कन्फर्म हिज सुप्रीम जस्टिस and his grace his supreme justice for the disbelievers why because yes Allah knew before we were created where we are going so he could have created believers put them in paradise and disbelievers and put them in hell right from the beginning we didn't need to go through this world and what was happening in it he could have done that because he knows what we are going to do However, because of the fact that those who would be placed in paradise would never question Allah, why did you put us in paradise? If you were put in paradise, would you ask Allah, why did you put me here? No, you wouldn't. You would just be happy you got there. And in fact, when you look at what you actually did in this life, and you see that it is only by Allah's mercy, His grace, that you made it to paradise, you will just say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. As Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said, no one would enter paradise merely on account of his deeds. 
Were it not for Allah's grace, no one would enter paradise. The companions asked him, even you, O Messenger of Allah, even you would not enter paradise? And he said, even I. So it is by the grace of Allah that those who enter paradise enter paradise. It's His grace. So us living the life and going into paradise, we recognize Allah's grace. But for the disbelievers, those placed in hell, how do you think they're going to feel? Allah puts them in hell and they see people put in paradise. What do you think they're going to say? That's life. They're going to say, why? Why are you putting us in hell? What have we done to deserve this? Why shouldn't we be in paradise like the others? And Allah says to them, if Allah said to them, well, you would have done this and you would have done that and you would have done the other and that's why you're going to hell. What do you think we are going to say? Those of us going to hell. Yeah, I guess that's what we would have done. He said, no, 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 no. I wouldn't have done those things. If I knew there was a heaven and a hell, I would never have done those things. No way. So Allah lets us live out our lives. So that the end, at the end of our lives, no one questions Allah. Why? When you read about the various verses where Allah describes people being taken to hell, nobody says why. Everybody instead says, okay, we now know for sure. Give us another chance. This is what people say, give us another chance. We'll do righteousness. Nobody questions why, because everybody knows they're in hell because they chose hell. They chose hell. Everybody had the opportunity, every opportunity to go to paradise, but they chose hell. So Allah's justice will not be questioned. Allah's justice will be supreme. It will be manifest in the judgment and our ending up in heaven or hell. Now relative to human beings, relative to human beings, this world serves as a test to produce two, one of two results, basically. One, for spiritual growth, and that's for the believers. And two, punishment, and that's for the disbelievers. Spiritual growth or punishment. Those are the main two purposes of the tests of this life. Now if we look on the spiritual growth, we consider how does tests produce spiritual growth? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that He created different people on different levels economically. He says, Wallahu faddala ba'dakum ala ba'din fir rizq. Allah has favored some of you over others in the provisions of this life. This is Surah Nahal, verse 71. If He wished, He could have created everybody equal, everybody having the same amount of money. No rich, no poor, just everybody on the same level. He could have done that. But had he done that, who then would develop the quality of generosity? How can you be generous when there's nobody to be generous to? Right? You can only be generous when you have and others don't have and you give. So for you to be able to give, it means there has to be people with less than you. So this is a part of the trial of this life. That Allah has favored some people being more wealthy than others. This is a trial that we have to live with. And the Prophet ﷺ advised us how to deal with that trial. He said, don't look to those above you. Those who Allah has favored over you with more wealth. Don't look at them. Don't look to them. This is what the West does in the media. That globalized media. It shows you the rich and the famous. Their lives. How enjoyable it is. They have this, they have that, they have the other. You know, wonderful lives. And so what does that put in your heart? I want to be like them. I want to have what they have. It creates in you jealousy, you, your desire for this. 
So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Because if you look at it, you will forget the favor which God has placed in your own life. So he said, look at those below you instead. And that way you will remember God's favor. So this is part of the test. Because there's always somebody worse off than you. No matter how bad your circumstance is, there is always somebody whose life is more tragic, is more difficult than your own. So, look to those below you. Then, we have calamities. Those are the general trials. Now we look at calamities. And it is important for us to understand calamities and their role in life. In terms of developing the, the spiritual, higher spiritual qualities of the individual, we know calamities is one of the primary tools used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the companions asked the Prophet وسلم, who among people, among humankind, receives the most calamities in their lives? And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, the prophets than those most like them than those most like them the prophets receive the most calamities in life so calamities obviously are a blessing relative to the prophets calamities are blessings you can look, for example, in the life of Prophet Yusuf in the Quran. Was not his life, his early life, a series of calamities? His brothers conspired against him, put him in a well. He was taken to Egypt. Things seemed to improve for a while. Then the wife of the ruler tried to seduce him. He ends up in jail. It's a good man. He was trying to do good. But calamities were happening to him one after the other. Getting worse and worse. And even after he was in jail. And he interpreted the dream of the two servants who had been put in with him. And he asked one of them to remember him when he gets out. When he got out, what happened? He forgot. He forgot for a number of years. And then he remembered and got him out. But note, even that forgetting, you could say the servant forgetting was not a good thing. He forgot. Prophet Yusuf could have gotten out six or seven years earlier. But he stayed in for an extra seven because this man forgot. But think, as some scholars have pointed out of Tafsir, had he gotten out when the servant got out, he would have probably returned to his same state as a servant. Okay? If the servant got out, told the ruler, well, listen, this was the case of Prophet Yusuf, you know, that really was a good guy, let him out. So he brings him out, he asks the women, the women admit, yes, we tricked him. We tricked, it's not true. What would happen to him? He would just become a servant again. But instead, Allah delayed his presence in the prison. So that when he came out, he came out having interpreted the dream of the ruler, which now put him in a special status. And so the ruler elevated him to be in charge of the stocks of the kingdom. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm Dr. Bilal Phillips and I'd like to extend to you from myself and from Peace TV the greetings of Eid al-Adha He would have probably returned to his same state as a servant. Okay? If the servant got out, told the ruler, well listen, this was the case of Prophet Yusuf, 
you know, that really was a good guy, let him out. So he brings him out, he asks the women, the women admit, yes, we tricked him. We tricked, it's not true. What would happen to him? He would just become a servant again. But instead, Allah delayed his presence in the prison. So that when he came out, he came out having interpreted the dream of the ruler, which now put him in a special status. And so the ruler elevated him to be in charge of the stocks of the kingdom. So those additional seven years were good for Prophet Yusuf. And such is the case of Prophet Abraham, his son Ismail, after not having children, getting that child, then building the Kaaba together, then Allah tells him, sacrifice that child. After bonding with that child, becoming so close to him, and then Allah says, take his life. This is a calamity. It's a command from God for Prophet Abraham, but personally, emotionally, it's a calamity. But he stood firm, and Allah rewarded him with generations of prophets. And that is the life of the prophets. But calamities in general, Allah tells us that it is the means for developing in us patience. Patience which is the key for success in this life. As Allah said, I will try you and test you with hunger, loss of wealth, loss of life, loss of your efforts. But give glad tidings to those who are patient. And that's for the believers. That calamity in their life only brings out their patience. And with that patience, Allah rewards them more as He did with the prophets. Calamities also serve as a reminder. As Allah said in Surah Sajda, verse 21, I will let them taste of the lesser punishment instead of the greater punishment in order that they return return to remembering Allah and for people who believe who have gone astray a calamity strikes them it reminds them to go back to Allah so there's good in that calamity had they not faced that calamity they would have continued on that misguided path and ended up in hell so it was a means to bring them back onto the path to paradise also calamities expose the hypocrites as Allah said do people think that they will be left alone after saying I believe without being tested without being tried this is to expose those whose faith is truth and those whose in fact is false but then, in the end, for the disbelievers, the calamities are punishments. As Allah says, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُسِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُسِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Beware, let those who contravene Allah's command, who go against Allah's command, beware that a calamity befall them or a severe punishment and he also said at Surah Nur verse 63 and he also said وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُسِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْإِقَابُ and fear beware of a calamity which will not only afflict those who are evil alone you happen to be amongst them, it can strike you also. And know that Allah is severe in punishment. So, trials, calamities in life can either make us grow or they can be a punishment. 
When we look at the plague amongst us today, AIDS, the world plague, and the plague of depression and suicide, where more people are dying from that than they're dying of AIDS. But let's take AIDS. AIDS, which everybody is aware of today. Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, he narrated a hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is found in Sunan ibn Majah, authentic hadith, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whenever promiscuity is openly practiced among a people, a plague and anguish will spread among them, which was unknown to their predecessors. Whenever promiscuity, what is promiscuity? Promiscuity is what you see on the television today. Nakedness. Sex in films. As if you're sitting in people's bedrooms. This is promiscuity. Openly practiced by the society. Whenever that takes place, a plague, a scourge, will spread among the people which was unknown to their predecessors. AIDS was unknown to our predecessors. AIDS fits that picture exactly. Some people ask, how do we know when a calamity is a punishment and when it is a blessing? How can we know? Well, you will decide whether it is a punishment or a blessing, how you respond to it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he gave us the win-win principle 1,400 years ago in a classical hadith narrated by Suhaib in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Ajaban li amril mu'min Inna amrahu kullahu khair Wa laysa dhalika li ahadin illa lil mu'min the affair of the believer is amazing. Indeed, all of his affair is good. And that is only in the case of the true believer. In asabathu sarra shakara fakana khairan la. If good befalls him, he is thankful to Allah. And it was good for him. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّا صَبَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ And if evil befalls him, he is patient. And it was good for him. عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ The affair of the believers is an amazing thing. وَلَيْسَ ذَلِكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And that is only in the case of the believer. This is our win-win principle. For the believer, when a calamity strikes, he or she is patient with it. They believe that ultimately it is for good. Ultimately it is for good. Whether we are able to recognize the good in it or not. And this is an important point, a very important point for us to grasp, because it is the key to living life according to the win-win principle. A calamity strikes. For people who don't understand the nature of calamity, that it can be for your good. In fact, Allah designed it for your good then they fall into despair and they fall into disbelief. If you listen to the disbeliever, an atheist, you ask him, why are you an atheist? He says to you, or she says, well, I had an aunt who was a very good woman, very kind, like Mother Teresa. She was doing good everywhere and for everybody. Then one day when she was crossing the road, a big truck came and hit her, smashed her, killed her, destroyed her. Why? Why? Why her? 
What did she do to deserve that? So because that individual doesn't have an answer, they fall into despair and disbelief. They say, it can't be a God. There cannot be a God. Because if there was a God and that God was good, he would not have let that happen to my aunt. But, for the true believer, he or she has a different perspective. They look at it from the perspective of Musa and Khidr. We all know the story in Surah Al-Kahf about Musa and Khidr. This is a story explaining to us the win-win principle. In story form, true story. We find that the international media, they are bombarding misinformation about Islam. They give a wrong meaning of the verses they quote, either of the Quran or the Hadith of the Prophet the media says that Muslims are extremists. I said, yes, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind. I'm extremely merciful. I'm extremely honest. I'm extremely just. Throughout the world, there are hundreds of Christian channels. There are Hindu channels. There are Jain channels. How many Islamic channels do we have? How many channels do we have for Dawa? What we should do, we should utilize the science and technology and turn the tables over and utilize it for good work. This media Means of mass communication can do wonders. wonders. Media and Islam, war or peace, in truth exposed. From those around. Not a single African tribe ever worshipped images before the white man came. Not one. They all worship God. Different, different name, but the concept, same. Islamic, Islamic, Islamic. He's a Muslim. He doesn't know. He's got the wrong label on. The Christian has Christianized him and make them to worship Jesus Christ. We have done nothing. Really. Islam in Africa in Man with a Mission. Coming soon on Peace TV. Ramadan beckons us to give our zakat. An important farb and a pillar of Islam. Several fatwas of distinguished scholars of Islam worldwide state that zakat can be given to support a non-profit Islamic satellite channel whose aim is to spread the truth of Islam. Every dollar you contribute helps Peace TV to refute allegations against Islam, misconceptions about Quran. What better choice do you have to spread the truth of Islam than Peace TV? Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donation to Islamic Research Foundation International, Islamic Bank of Britain, Coventry Road, Birmingham, UK. Account number 0113201. Sort code 300083. When Musa and Khidr crossed the river, and Prophet Moses saw Khidr break the boat after they got off the boat. The man who took them across the river was so kind to take them across the river. They got out the boat and Khidr broke a hole, made a hole in the boat. Moses said to him, why did you do that? This is not something good. The man has done good for us and you've broken his boat. Perhaps people will drown because of it. Of course, when the owner of the boat came back and he saw the hole in his boat, he would have said, who did this? This wasn't a good thing. But then, moments later, when the king came down the river, grabbing all of the boats, just taking people's boats from them, and he came across the boat of that individual, saw the hole in it, I don't need that one that's broken. Carried on. And the owner of the boat would have said what? Alhamdulillah for the hole in my boat. Huh? Alhamdulillah for the hole in my boat. And this is something we all experience, isn't it? Where something happens in life, you think it's something not good, it's bad at the moment. Then moments later, a day later or whatever, you find out, oh, it's something good really. If that hadn't happened, this thing wouldn't have happened. A good example of that 
was an article I saw in a newspaper coming out of Cairo, Egypt. They had the picture of an individual standing with his two thumbs up, like this. A big smile on his face. His father kissing him on his right cheek, his mother kissing him on his left cheek. There he is with two thumbs up, big smile, from ear to ear. The explanation underneath. He was a teacher. The day before, he was supposed to get on a flight to Bahrain, a Gulf Air flight to Bahrain. This was the last flight back for teachers. Holiday was over, they had to go back to work. It was the last flight. He was booked on the flight. He ran to the airport with his bags, everything ready to go, showed his passport to get on the flight. And the officer looked at the passport, he said, you're missing one stamp. And in Egypt, you have to get many stamps to get anything done. Not enough for you to have one person stamp it. No, he has to take it to another one who stamps it. And that one takes it to another one who stamps it. To, till it comes back around to the first one who stamps all of the other stamps. So he was missing one stamp. And they said, no, you can't get on the plane. He said, my job. I'm going to lose my job. I have to get on the plane. I can't miss this flight. They said, no, you don't have that stamp. You have to go back to the office. You can't do it. You'd have to come back the next day. He'd miss his flight. If he missed his flight, it meant what? He lost his job. Calamity. He went home depressed. His life had crumbled. The next day he read in the newspaper, or he heard over the news, that that Gulf Air flight going to Bahrain crashed. And everyone died, no survivors. And there he was. There he was. What the day before was the ultimate calamity became the ultimate success for him. And that is the nature of this life. That whatever happens to us, no matter how evil it may appear, there is good behind it for us. Why Allah has permitted this evil, what we perceive as evil, to happen to us, is because there is some good behind it, which is for us. Now this is important, an important point. Now, sometimes we see that evil, and sometimes we can't see it. We can't find an explanation for it. And this is what the atheist might say, okay, I agree with you, there are some evil things that happen, there is good behind it, but what about this tsunami? All those people, 100,000 people lost their lives, where is the good in that? Children, wash the sea, innocent people not doing anything evil, why? Where is the, where is the good in that? We can't see any good. So they say there can't be a God. There's no God. Because a good God would not allow that to happen. Unless you believe in a good God and a bad God. You have some people because they couldn't deal with this idea of God allowing evil to happen. You have the Parsis, right? Fire worshippers. They believe in Ahura Mazda, the God of good, and Angramanyu, the God of evil. Because they didn't want to attribute evil to God. So, if you believe in a good God, how do you explain that? Well, the story of Khidr tells us. After Khidr had broken the boat with Musa and he went ahead, down the river bank, they came across a young boy, about 11 or 12 years old. And Khidr grabbed the boy and tore off his head. He grabbed the boy and tore off his head. Musa said, what have you done? You have taken the life of an innocent child. How could you do this? Khidr then explained to him, after a few other incidents, he explained to him that really this child, had he grown up 
he would have been such a calamity on his parents. Parents were believers. But he would have made their life so horrible that they would have fallen into disbelief. So Allah, in order to protect them, took the life of the child. Now of course, those parents when they found their child with his head ripped off, they would have said, what a horrendous crime. Who did this to our child? Murdered him. Though Allah gave them another child, a girl, who honored them, treated them well, etc. And they loved her, but still there would be that hole in their heart for their first child, their son, who was murdered. Until Yawmul Qiyamah, when they stand up before Allah, and Allah shows them their life, and what would have happened to them, then they will say, Alhamdulillah, that our child's life was taken. That is the example of the calamity whose good we cannot see. The calamity whose good we are not able to see. And this is life. This is how life is. In that, your child, your young child, three years old, four years old, you take him to the dentist, right? first time you take him you tell him the dentist is a nice man or woman they're nice people see their nice white coat the big smile they're nice people but when the dentist takes that needle and sticks it in the child and the child screams what do you think has happened in the mind of the child now is this person a nice person anymore no that is a bad person so what happens the next time you try to take the child to the dentist? No way! No, no! They refuse to go. No way! You try to tell them, you cannot convince the three-year-old that going to the dentist the second time is good. You can't. All that that child can see is pain, suffering. But you, who are more mature, you understand that the pain is to prevent a greater pain. The lesser pain is to prevent a greater pain of a rotten tooth, you know, which root canal, all the other things that come behind it. But that child can't see it. All the child can see is that dentist sticking the needle in them. And that's how we are. We cannot see the good behind certain apparent evils. Because our minds are not capable of grasping it. Allah didn't reveal it to us in this life. But that doesn't mean because we can't see it, there is no good. We believe that ultimately there is good. In whatever takes place. Because Allah... As he said, وَهُوَ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He is the creator of everything. The good and the evil. He is the creator of everything. If it takes place, it is by his permission. So therefore, all we can do is trust in Allah that it is for good and accept it and be patient with it. And if we do that, then it is good for us, as the Prophet ﷺ said. In that way, for the believer, we think win-win. We win when good comes, good befalls us, life is good, we're living well. We don't forget Allah, because good, wealth, can be a test. It can be the source of misguidance. So. We don't forget Allah, we remember Allah. In fact, remembering Allah in times of ease and success is far more difficult than remembering Allah in times of difficulty. 
لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is Brother Salim Al-Amri My dear brothers and sisters who are intending to perform the Hajj this year, may Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for you. May Allah Azza wa Jal accept your Hajj. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant you a safe return. Amen. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm Yusuf Chambers and I'd like to wish all the pilgrims an accepted hajj Remembering Allah in times of ease and success is far more difficult than remembering Allah in times of difficulty. Remember this. Because we often think remembering Allah in times of difficulty, that's the tough one. No. Even the person who doesn't believe in Allah can remember Him. Uh, no, sorry, not remember Him, but be patient. Being patient can be patient in times of difficulty. Yeah, normally difficulty comes, people fall apart. But there are some people who say, what is the point of falling apart? It's not going to change the situation. So I will just, as they say, grin and bear it. I'll bite the bullet. I'll swallow it. No point in getting worked up. A disbeliever can do that. But being patient in times of success, this is the difficult one. Only the believer will be able to do it. Patient meaning that we remain within the bounds of Islamic law during those times. This is the big test for many people. You are fine when you're poor, but when you become rich, then your life changes. You're not fine anymore. You don't share, you become greedy, you become this, you become that. Your whole personality changes. Because that is a big trial. And that's why Allah said, Inna min, aw, min amwalikum wa awladikum fitna. Among in your wealth and your children, there is calamity and trial. So beware of them. Beware of them. There's a trial there. So this is the true believer. When good comes, success comes, he or she is patient. And Allah rewards them. Patient meaning that they fulfill Allah's right in their success. They share their wealth. They use it in a good way, in ways which are beneficial for themselves and their families and their children, for their society. Rather than squandering it and indulging in all of the pleasures and just forgetting themselves and forgetting Allah. And at the same time, when difficulty calamity and trial comes they're patient they're patient with it knowing in with every difficulty comes ease that's Allah's promise no soul will be burdened more than they can bear that is Allah's promise so there is no excuse nobody can say it was too much God burdened me more than I could handle Therefore, I took my life. No. That's why suicide is haram. Suicide is a person saying, God, you have burdened me beyond my capacity. I can't deal with this. And that is not true. That is a lie about God. None of us is in a situation beyond our ability. Otherwise, then there would be injustice. God would be unjust to us. And God is not unjust. So for the believer in those times of trial, calamity, he or she is patient and Allah rewards them fourfold. So back to the beginning, the motto of the true believer is win, win. But our certainty that ultimately it is from Allah and it is for our good helps us to overcome the excesses in those emotional states of weakness. 
we are able to keep it under control and we are able to deal with the various trials, the ups and downs of life. The inner peace comes through this. That sense of contentment in dealing with one's situation. And I will just close my presentation reminding you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us those of us who have committed ourselves to believe in Allah has chosen us and given us a special mission and that mission is to convey this word this word this, this message of Islam to the world around us so let us carry the message of win-win which people need to hear there's so many people committing suicide here in India having one of the highest suicide rates in the world they need to hear this message that for the believer there is no loss it is not win-lose it is win-win let's carry that message forward I ask Allah to give you all and myself the courage to carry this great responsibility, the legacy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this world, this uh, community that we live amongst. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, there will be question and answer session for this uh, lecture that uh, Dr. Abu Amin Bilal Phillips has just given. Uh, I urge all of you to stick to the topics so that you know, it will be uh, all connected and then we can go forward, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, I'm Satyendra. Uh, according to me, you know, there is no concept of uh, hell and heaven. You know? So it's created only on the earth. So it doesn't exist. And also according to me, there is no life after death. You know? So I just die like I guess I go to sleep. And I think uh, it's as true as a scientist. And my question to also, you said uh, calamities happens, sometimes good, sometimes bad. The examples which you gave is individual exams, uh, uh, indiv individual examples, the hole in the boat, yeah, and another one about the stamp. But when you talk about the calamities like uh, the Jews, two million Jews killed in uh, Germany, and what happened tsunami? and what's happening in Iraq, you know. So these kind of things, you cannot say even it happened about 50 years ago, what happened in Germany, you cannot say everything happened for good. What you are given is individual examples. Okay, um, the first question, well, not really a question, it's sort of like a statement that you don't believe in heaven and hell and that when you die, that's all there is. Wherever people go in this world, there is religion and people have a concept of heaven and hell. So now, if you find yourself in a situation where the whole world, the most ancient of societies, the most modern, the most primitive, even when we dig up archaeologically, etc., we have this concept of heaven and hell existing throughout the world and then you by yourself say it doesn't exist we have to say you are mistaken if the mass of humankind have come to that conclusion whether by logic or by revelation or by however the mass of humankind hold this position but you by yourself and a few others like you say that it doesn't exist what does it mean the likelihood of you being correct is very small. Because when we try to determine, when we try to determine what things are real and what things are made up by people, you know, the things which we find everywhere, no matter where you go on the earth, common to all human beings, these are the things that most likely have a reality. The things which are found only in limited areas, these are the things, which, and they differ from place to place, these are the things which tend not to have reality. So I would just respond to your statement as something you need to think about. 
You said it and that's your opinion and you're entitled to your opinion. But just know that you are a minority throughout the history of the earth as we know it. And being in that small minority is a very dangerous place to be. Because one, if there is no heaven and hell, and the belief in heaven and hell made the mass of humankind good, they didn't lose anything. But if there is a heaven and hell, then you are the loser. You and those who hold your belief are the losers. Muslim, living in any part of the world, he is our brother. We should feel for him. Muslims are suffering. Muslims are butchered. Muslims are slain. And some of us even, they don't feel, they don't cry over that. Salim Al-Amri. If one organ is in pain, the whole body feels that. Whether he's in India, whether he's in Far East, whether he's wherever the Muslim is, he is my brother. I should feel for him. Anything which contradicts the way of Rasulullah is wrong. Anything which contradicts the Quran of any of the other scriptures is wrong. The Quran is 100% the word of Allah. Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips. Everything else was martyr, it's clear, it is false, and we call to that truth. This is the truth. Suffered what we would call a terrible death. Right? This was a mass tragedy. And that was the good which came out of it. So I'm saying, if it can happen on an individual level, then it can happen on a group level. We don't need, just as on an individual level, we may not be able to see the reason behind it happening on that individual level. Similarly, on the group level, we may not be able to see the reason. That's the basic principle that we were addressing. Okay? Sir, Hinduism is uh, worship the nature, that is, say, river, or uh, tree, or what are things which uh, they give us, uh, food, or what they give us, so many things, water, or what are things. But uh, such thing is not practiced in other uh, um, uh, religion. And even what we worship is nothing but the embodiment of nature. Say Shiva, that is the procreation of nature. So is the, what are all your views on this? Well, in Islam, we worship the creator. The one who is the provider. I mean, the concept of honoring um, one who does good for you, one who provides for you, etc., is a natural uh, emotion, a natural feeling that people have. You honor your parents, you feel good towards your parents, etc., because they have looked after you, taken care of you. Similarly, you may have a cow which gives you milk, so you, res you respect that animal. You have a, a you know, sheep which provides you with wool, so you make your clothing, you respect that animal also. You know? So uh, where you get benefit, you have a certain respect and a love for those things. That's natural. However, worship is something else. Worship involves calling on a being to do for you what you are incapable of doing for yourself. Submitting your will to that being. And that belongs only to God. Because the cow, the sheep, the trees, the nature, the rivers, etc., they cannot respond to us. They provide for us because God has put something in them that make them providers for us. It is not by their choice. A cow doesn't stop to think, shall I give humans milk or not? And then they decide to give milk to humans like a nice cow. No. The cow has no choice about it. Similarly with the sheep and its wool, 
the river and the fish, the trees and the fruit. This is not by choice. So God, as it states in the Quran, has submitted the world for us. So whatever benefit we take from the world around us, that is ultimately from God. God has submitted the creatures, the, the world, to us. So therefore, the one we call on, the one we seek help from, the one we seek guidance, we seek protection, that is the creator of all these things. That is God. So that is the Muslim view. To worship God's creation, this is called shirk. This is worshiping, turning the creation into God. Whether it is a man, men, or animals, this is worshiping God's creation instead of worshiping God. My name is Sam Matthew. Yeah, I would like to make an observation here that I find uh, two converts from Christianity as a majority here. Not that I'm saying I'm also a Christian, not that I'm saying Christianity is the ultimate. It's only an observation. But my question is to Mr. Bilal, for one, one of the questions that was asked, is there heaven and hell? You replied that because of the majority, what the majority thinks you follow. So as an individual, do you uh, have any con con uh, conviction whether you are going to hell or to heaven or to paradise or to hell? So just because the majority are believe that there is paradise, so you believe. But my question is, if that is the case, the Hinduism has got the majority uh, of the people. They believe Hinduism has got the maximum majority. So which means why don't you believe in Hinduism also? If I'm right, I, th I think uh, Hinduism is the biggest uh, religion in the world. Or, okay, or Christianity, whatever. So why don't you, uh, why don't you believe that Christianity is right. When you say that majority thinks that the, uh, is going to a paradise, then why don't you also similarly believe that Christianity is the ultimate? Okay. One, you misquoted me. I didn't say I believe, uh, Matthew, I didn't say that I believe that there is a heaven and hell because the majority believe it. That's not what I said. I was only responding to our other friend here's uh, doubt or rejection of heaven and hell. So I was just asking him to reflect. Not the majority of one religion, but the majority of humankind. Reject, reflect on that. But I believe in heaven and hell, one, because of the fact that I accepted Islam to be the true religion of God. And the teachings of Islam, as conveyed by Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and all of the prophets before him, Prophet Jesus, Prophet Abraham, Moses, all of the prophets also spoke of heaven and hell. So because I believe in the way of life, the system known as Islam, I, that, that is a part of the teachings. I accepted it on that, on one hand, and on the other hand, my reason accepted it because it made sense to me that this life is not all there is, that there had to be a life to come because there are so many unresolved matters in this life. If Hitler just dies and then that's it, and a righteous person dies and that's it, and it's just the same, there seems to be some inherent, inherent uh, unfairness here. Because they both died. The fact that one committed suicide, the other one died in their sleep, whatever, they still just died. That was the end. One committed great evil, 
the other one committed great good and they both just died and then that's it no that was not logical that was illogical didn't make sense what made sense is that there is a life to come in which the evil of that individual he would have to meet and the righteousness and goodness of the other he or she would also meet that made sense to me so I accepted the concept of heaven and hell one because it was a part of the teachings of the religion which I accepted as a system the most practical system to live my life by and that was a part of the teachings the one who brought that system he told about heaven and hell I believed it but I also believed it intellectually in that as I said it made sense to me also so it is not I didn't believe in heaven and hell because the majority believed in it I own I believe in it because it is a part of the system which I accepted and because it made sense to me logically which is a Kumala Khair assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh